This is BBC News. I'm Rebecca Jones. The headlines at 11. And in the next hour, remembering one of Britain's greatest wartime leaders. A very good morning and welcome to BBC News. The Eurozone has slid further into deflation, with a much steeper decline in prices than had been expected. In January, prices in the Eurozone were 0.6% down on a year ago. The region first fell into deflation in December with a 0.2% drop, and now Germany has joined the list of countries affected. Well, our business presenter, Caroline Hepker, is here to explain more. Uh, Caroline, what does this mean for the Eurozone? Well, I think there are two sides to this. The worry is that falling prices becomes a vicious cycle. Uh, so people expect prices to fall, businesses and consumers delay their purchases, and then things tumble. Uh, but there's also an upside in this case, so-called good inflation, which is when, for example, energy prices uh, fall, as they have done in December, down 8.9%. And that means there's more money in people's pockets to spend more, something that could actually spur uh, a really troubled uh, Eurozone economy. So there are two ways of looking at this, really, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. But it, what it does certainly is to reinforce the case for the European Central Bank, who have decided to launch a stimulus programme to help the Eurozone, which begins in March. What seems to have taken people surprise though is the how how the decline has been so steep and so sudden yes indeed well uh it hasn't taken us by surprise in the sense that all prices have, have been slashed by 60% since June. But yes, you're right. The 0.6% drop is certainly uh, slightly more deflation than we were expecting. And the other thing that has worried people, you mentioned it, was Germany. Uh, Germany is seeing falling prices, and that's, um, that's unusual. Germany has been you know, one of uh, the strongest uh, countries in the Eurozone. And even there, there is weakness. For example, um, service sector inflation uh, has been pretty weak, I think around uh, 1% or just above. Um, so that, that's sort of a worry. And the other thing about deflation that really uh, causes people concern is that it makes debts more difficult to repay. And debt has been a big issue for countries across the Eurozone. You know, for example, Italy, hugely indebted. Um, if deflation continues for any long period, uh, then that will make it harder for the government to, to get their debt uh, under control. And is there a sense that deflation will consider for, continue for a long period, or is it too early to say? Well, actually, I was speaking to an economist just earlier, um, Christian Schultz from Berenberg Bank, and he said, look, expectation is the big thing. Um, the ECB has, has launched this stimulus program. Everyone knows that it's about to come online in March, so actually, perhaps that will prevent deflation from taking hold. OK, Caroline, we'll talk more later on for now. Many thanks. And we'll have more on this with our Brussels correspondent in half an hour's time. Now, the government says there'll be no change to medical training unless it's in patients' best interests. Some leading doctors have warned that proposals to shorten training in the UK could compromise care and safety. And the Royal College of Physicians wants the process to be put on hold. An independent review has suggested that doctors are registered as soon as they're out of medical school, instead of waiting a year. It also says consultants' training could be cut by two years. Well, a little earlier, our health editor, Hugh Pym, addressed questions that have emerged around the transparency and political independence of the review. That was our health editor, Hugh Pym. Well, with us now is Professor Jane Dacre, Chair of the Royal College of Physicians. Thanks for coming in to talk to us. So what do you make of this report and its recommendations to be put to one side? We want more consultation. More consultants working with more patients, and therefore that would be good for patients and good for the NHS. Uh, I don't... Now, we're getting more details of a bomb blast at a Shia mosque in southern Pakistan, which took place after Friday prayers. The explosion was in the town of Shikapur, around 300 miles north of Karachi. Police are reported as saying... It Militants who pledge allegiance to the Islamic State group have claimed responsibility for attacks in Egypt that killed at least 30 people, mostly from the security forces. Well, Radwa Gamal from the BBC's Arabic service gave us this update from Cairo. Radwa Gamal there. 
Now, one of the most notorious killers of apartheid-era South Africa, Eugene de Kock, has been granted parole after nearly two decades in prison. He was nicknamed Prime Evil for his role in the killing and maiming of activists in the 1980s and early 1990s. Well, earlier, the country's justice minister said de Kock was released in the interests of nation-building. Our Africa correspondent, Andrew Harding, gave us the background to de Kock's parole bid. More than a third of secondary school children in England are overweight or obese. That's according to a study of more than 370,000 children. But researchers at King's College London say there are signs that the rise in the number of children who are overweight is starting to level off. Our health correspondent Dominic Hughes has more. Corruption inside police forces in England and Wales isn't being investigated properly, according to a new report which says more than half of forces don't have the capability or resources needed. The Inspectorate of Constabulary also raised concerns that when investigations into allegations of wrongdoing are carried out, the vast majority result in no action. Our Home Affairs correspondent Danny Shaw reports. Let's update you with the headlines now on BBC News. Time to catch up with all the sports news now. And over at the BBC Sports Centre, here's Hugh. Hi there. Hi there. Two balloonists trying to break two world records for crossing the Pacific have been forced to change course off the coast of California and head for Mexico rather than Canada. The two adventurers, an American and a Russian, are trying to break the record for the longest flight by distance and by time in an old-style helium balloon. From Los Angeles, Alistair Leithhead reports. A woman and a baby have been killed in Mexico City after a gas tank lorry exploded outside a maternity and children's hospital. A Canadian ice climber has stunned visitors to the Niagara Falls by climbing up a frozen section of the famous gorge. The headlines are coming up on the BBC News Channel. In a moment, we say goodbye to viewers on BBC Two. But first, we leave you with a look at the weather. Germany has joined the list of countries affected. Well, our correspondent Damien Grammaticus figures with you where you are prevention from the European Central Bank following these figures? No, because uh, that... That, uh, in that deflation is settling in across the Eurozone. We've begun our countdown for this year's general election and we've been travelling around the country to key seats to catch the mood of the nation. And today we're in Tunbridge Wells. And we can go live now to our political correspondent, Louise Stewart. And Louise, you're in Kent. Uh, talk us through what the key battlegrounds there are. Well, Kent seems like a pretty safe conservative area, but it has to be said there are going to be some uh, key battlegrounds here. For one, Rochester and Strood. You may remember the almighty battle at the by-election in November, triggered by the defection of the Conservative MP there, Mark Reckless, to UKIP, the UK Independence Party. Now, the Prime Minister said he was going to throw everything, including the kitchen sink at that seat, to retain it. In the end, though, Mark Reckless's majority was slashed from 10,000 to just under three but they didn't retain it and he became the second UKIP MP at Westminster. They'll be hoping to hold on to that at the election. And elsewhere in Kent, uh, South Thanet promises to be an absolutely key battleground, not just here in the southeast, but in the entire general election. Why? Because it's where Nigel Farage, the UKIP leader, has chosen to stand. The incumbent Conservative MP, Laura Sands, she's got a majority of 7,500. She's not standing again, so Nigel Farage will go head to head with uh, the Conservative candidate, Craig McKinley, who also happens to be a former UKIP party treasurer. So that's going to be a crucial and exciting battleground there. But if we cross to Sussex, uh, just across the border, another key battleground, uh, lots of seats there, very marginal. Uh, Labour keen to target them, take them from the Conservatives. But one marginal seat there is held at the moment by Westminster's only Green MP, Caroline Lucas. She's got a tiny majority, just 1,200. She'll be desperate to hold on there, but Labour very keen to see if they can take that scalp. OK, lovely for now. Many thanks. It began as an onboard tantrum about a packet of nuts. But now the woman at the centre of the row on a Korean air flight could face up to 10 years in jail. She's the daughter of the chairman of the company. And when she became upset at the way nuts were served to her, she insisted the plane return to the departure gate. 
Well, earlier, Steve Evans, our correspondent in the South Korean capital, Seoul, gave us this update. Around 11 million immigrants are living illegally in the United States. At the end of last year, President Obama said he was going to offer some of them an amnesty with strict conditions attached. But many of the so-called illegals have been reluctant to, as he said, come out of the shadows. What Sir Winston Churchill's life and career are being remembered and celebrated on the 50th anniversary of his state funeral. A number of commemorative events are taking place in London. In a moment, a summary of the business news this hour. But first, the headlines on BBC News. See you later, Caroline. This is BBC News, coming up in the next few minutes. Headlines in a moment. First, though, let's catch up with all the weather news. Central bankers try and avoid. Uh, you'll notice that many central banks still say that they're going to achieve their inflation targets and a two-year horizon. And this is all about trying to lift our expectations about inflation and trying to get us not to postpone consumption habits. And what effect does deflation have on the euro? Well, of course, the central bank that has seen uh, a deflation or disinflation when, when prices are shrinking, uh, then they will try and weaken their exchange rate. If you have a softer exchange rate, well, technically you could export more because your goods become cheaper. And also you can import a little bit of inflation. The, the goods that you import become uh, higher in, in your currency. Uh, but however, we've got disinflation in a number of countries now, disinflation or deflation. And this means that many central banks are playing the same game. We've seen interest rates come down through a number of different countries. The aim of that is, of course, to weaken their currencies. But of course, some are going to be weaker than others. Not all currencies can weaken simultaneously. So some are more successful than others. Now, recently, uh, the European Central Bank has been very successful in weakening the euro. And this means that, that they should see a benefit to their exports, which should hopefully uh, produce some more growth in the Eurozone. OK, Jane Foley from Rabobank, we're grateful for your time. Many thanks. The government says there'll be no change to medical training unless it's in patients' best interests. Some leading doctors have warned that proposals to shorten training in the UK could compromise care and safety. And the Royal College of Physicians warns that wants the process put on hold. An independent review has suggested that doctors are registered as soon as they're out of medical school, instead of waiting a year. It also says consultants' training could be cut by two years. Well, a little earlier, the chair of the Royal College of Physicians, Professor Jane Dacre, gave me her reaction to the proposals and its recommendations to be put to one side. We want more consultation. More consultants working with more patients and therefore that would be good for patients and good for the NHS. Uh, I don't, we don't. Professor Jane Dacre there, Chair of the Royal College of Physicians. It's exactly 12.15, let's update you with the headlines. <laughs> Busy day in sport. Let's catch up with everything that's happening with Hugh. Hi there, Hugh. 